morning. Welcome if you're online with us uh, far away or if you're here with us present. We are overjoyed to come together and to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Are we, are we awake? Are we ready to worship God this morning? I pray so, because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm so glad everyone is here this morning. If you are new, we want to welcome you. We want you to feel invited. If you are coming back from a time away, we're glad to have you returning to us as well. Just a couple of announcements. One, today is a very special day. We have a very special picnic that is happening a little bit later today at 1230. You can get more information on the back of your bulletin. We'd love to have you there. It might be a little bit warm, but we, we have a covering, so we will stay nice and cool together, and we'll have a wonderful time of celebration and the beginning of the season of Sunday School, which is starting up soon. And I wanted to give you guys an, a, an understanding for the adults for Sunday School, we have a plan. We're not just, uh, we're not just guessing at something. Uh, Pastor Don and also uh, Dr. Huff are going to lead a study through a, a video series called The American Gospel. And this is going to be uh, little clips that they're going to show and then a discussion and have that discussion together and a little bit deeper time of studying God's Word right here in the sanctuary. So for this first semester... Of, uh, of Sunday school. That will be what's going on upstairs for the adults. The kids downstairs, we're going to have uh, lots of wonderful uh, study with each one of the different levels for each child, and we're excited to have that as well. So that is starting on the 12th. Okay, so mark your calendar. The 12th of September is when Sunday school begins. All right, my other question is how many of you had one of these? Yeah, oh, I see one or two hands. Okay, you can raise your hands. It's okay. We've been praying for the children in the church, specifically those who are in the, high, the junior high and high school age, for this year. And during this year, this book, uh, Pray For Me, which has been a campaign that we've done this past year, has encouraged us to pray for these children every single day in seven different facets of their life and to pray over them as far as Scripture goes and for the Lord's blessing in their life. And I pray that those who have had this have been praying for them and lifting them up and doing so. We are planning in the midst of September, I haven't given you a date yet, but it'll be after the 12th, we're going to have a, a time of celebration during the worship service for the children and also for those who have been praying and doing this. So bring, I plan on finding that book if you haven't had it right next to you, but if you have and you're like me and, and you've got notes in it and all sorts of things, and you would like to bless that student with this book, we will have that opportunity uh, later on in this next month. So plan for that, uh, get your books ready, and anything that you want to add to it or add any other prayers, that would be wonderful. Let's begin our time of prayer our time of praise, and our time of joy in the presence of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much that You have brought us to this time to worship You and to praise You. Lord, bring our hearts together as one right now that we would worship You in spirit and in truth. We ask for the blessing of You, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this time, lifting us beyond these pews into Your presence that we would know You by our songs, by the Scripture that is read, and by the Word that is preached. Lord, be glorified in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 We need some instruction on one of the songs, and I notice the people who need to be here, who make this mistake all the time, are not here. So we need to reinforce our singing on this particular song. I'm just kidding, guys. I sound very serious. But I am serious. If, if you turn to the page uh, where it says, Sing to the Lord, all you saints of His. PowerPoint, just stay still. You don't need to go anywhere. Sing to the Lord, all you saints of His. Are you there in your bulletin? It's on page whatever. Um, and you're going to go to the second paragraph where it says, Sing to the Lord, all you saints of His, and give 
thanks, okay? In the children's sermon, we've been talking about a scale. And so many times when we're in that sing to the Lord and that refrain that comes back, we're not singing it properly. And we want to cut to the chase here and, and learn it this way. So Glenda, if you play sing to the, to the Lord, all you saints of his. Yeah, that's the pitch we want. <laughs> to the Lord, all you saints of his and give. It's a scale. It's one on, one, one on top of the other. And it doesn't, and we're singing the wrong note on all. Now, who cares? <laughs> and it, you, really, who, who cares that we're, we miss that? I do, and the Lord cares. <laughs> so, um, just be alert. <laughs> Could you do that? Um, sing to the Lord. And, and we start, all you saints of his and give. Do, do, re, mi, sa, fa, sol, do, whatever it is. Okay, try it with me. Sing to the Lord, all you saints of his, and give, and so forth. The rest you get. I'm really speaking to the choir because I could pick out everyone who does that wrong, and I won't do that because, uh, but for my sanity, please do it right. Now, try it one more time. Sing, sing to the Lord, all you saints of his, and give them. You need no instruction. You're the ones that do it right. I hope they're watching. Now, be alert because we're pumped for the Lord this morning. And uh, Mrs. Wilson's going to lead us in the first song in a moment. Um, and then during the children's sermon, we need all God's children. And some of you have been appointed chimers out here in the, the older children in the pews. And some are back here. And so when I say chimers come up, you'll come up, and I'll give you a chime, just saying that. Some of you, you know who you are. Uh, I do too, so. All right, let's praise the Lord with this wonderful Psalm 63 that Mrs. Wilson will now lead us in. And stay seated as we pray. Reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, 
but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for every gift that you give us. We thank you for the heat in this really hot time. We thank you for the cool air during the winter times, and we appreciate some this afternoon too. But Lord, we recognize that every good gift comes from you, and we bless you. As we think of the many things going on in this world around us, we think of the uh, things we've seen in the news this past week and the things we're probably going to see this week with the storms. We recognize that you are on the throne and you are in control, and we have confidence that your plan is perfect and will come about in the time that you have prescribed. We pray this morning that we would cast aside those things that distract us and that we would focus on bringing you praise and glory, that we would have ears to hear what will come from your word this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. We declare what we believe in so many ways, as we've mentioned in many times past, and the song that we're about to sing is part of like a creed that we believe. We are your church, O Lord. And we'll fast forward to um, the children's sermon this morning about being the church. And if there's anyone lacking in the congregation, we miss you. So stand together as we sing, We Are Your Church, and we'll proceed from there. guidance that he can give us. So we sing, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Oh, be with thy power. 
singing of this song from Psalm 30. Sing to the Lord all you saints of his. from a different version, wailing into dancing.
Be ready. seated if you're able. Now, before we continue, I was that close, that close of doing the Israeli Hora dance that Mrs. Habermill taught us back in the early 80s, that's where I met her. But I tried that once before and got into big trouble. But let's move in that direction if you could. Uh, kids, you're wonderful. Andrew, thank you for smiling me through that one. We get now to sing the conclusion of our life in glory and then go into glory. As, as uh, Ron de Haas says, it's from death to life. No worries. So let's be seated for this because you're going to be worn out if I don't allow you to sit down. There's a higher throne.
Yes, hallelujah. Be seated. Now, I have five minutes to do this. This is the fourth Sunday of talking about the church, and I hope you're getting the, the correlation between the chimes and the church. And I probably felt like Mrs. Cross this morning while she's trying to gather people together for the Sunday school, and she's wondering, is it going to work? And pray for her, and pray for those who need to be, come forward and teach that. Well, I lost sleep over this. I thought, who is in their right mind, I'm the perfect person for that, would try this. We're going to have 22 chimers from one generation to the next playing a scale and then, this, then some chords, 22. I have a whole other black chime set too, which I can't even get to. And boy, are oh, those fun to do. So I'm going to ask the people on the podium first to take their um, chime, and then I'm going to say chimers come forth, which means I need Graham and I need... Uh, I may need people from the Bentley crew, whether I told you this or not, okay? Because I'm, I'm missing people up here. So children come forth first here, the, children, the, the younger children, not the people in the pews. And, and Andrew, just coming up so I, I know you're here, even though you're not part of the children's thing. Anyone else that I need? Uh, Lydia, Lydia, if you want to come for Lydia Shrupford, that'd be great. I can use you if she's here. And, and uh, uh, Carter, good. Now let's parcel these out, um, and you're going to stand somewhere, you're going to start over here, and this way, and we go all the way around the room to about there, it's about 22 people. Okay, this is well known, this is Davis, you have the honor of playing the big gun. <laughs> Believe me, she's strong. going around. Hold it like an ice cream cone, but don't lick it. Uh, Carter. Lydia, you want to try this? I hope so. You're here. I might. You hold it like this, and I'll show you how to play it. But you have to get in line over here, though. Uh, just keep going next to Carter and go down the steps. We're going to. All right, so we have, okay, chimers in the pews. Would you come forward? that you've been assigned. Okay. And just keep, and if I run out, I'm sorry. It's just I tried to count. And people were late coming in, that's another issue. Just saying. Okay, now, um, So make sure you're in line alphabetically. Uh, Graham, your dad can help you, or maybe you know how to do it. Just don't let go of it. Dad can supervise it. Okay, and Mr. Um, Laharsky, you're going to be number. Well, would you like to try it? You don't have to. Just hold it. Yeah, what you do, just, yeah, just hold it like that and I'll show you how to do it. All right, now, wonderful. This is the church, part of it. And if someone's missing, it won't work. Am I making sense, everybody? We have a three-octave scale, and I'll point. Now, again, if you miss it, don't worry. This, this is just a practice. You know, if it doesn't sound, and make sure you just hold it here, not touching anything up here, because you'll bend it. Got lots of rules. Okay, Mrs. Dave, I'll point to you as you go up. You can see me, ready? One at a time.
You're going too fast, not watching me. Yes. Wonderful. Now, so, no, no applause, no applause. Uh, someone played their chime too loud. Do you know who that was? Colin. It was Colin Rose. And we're going to do it once again and try to listen so that you're right in tune. Sorry. Um, I have latitude here, I guess. All right, we're going to start. Let's start from the top and go down. Are you ready? Uh, Nolan? Watch me. All right, good. Now, you notice they've got to be alert. Um, who was it? Mr. Habermill, you were too loud. <laughs> but he's a big guy, but he's got to learn to control that. So, but we all made it. Some of us had a little difficulty doing that. We learned how to do it. We learned how to do it. Now, look at the letter on your chime. Look at the letter on your chime. I'm going to say play all those who have C-E-G play when my hand tells you to play. So you've got to watch the conductor. You've got to watch Pastor Jason when he's preaching. Don't go to sleep. You may miss out. All right. If you have a C-E-G, ring with my chime, my hand here when I tell you to. You'll know when. Ah, that was almost perfect. Try it once again so everyone's right together. If you're not, I'll teach you how later. But just watch the hand. You'll know when to chime. Ready? Yes. If you've got a DFA, a DFA, look at your letter, ready? Beautiful, wonderful, ready? The next E, G, B, you got it? Go. Wow, this is a good group. F, A, C, ready? Okay. G, B, D, F, ready? All right, let's give a surprise. A, C, E, G. Go back to G, B, D, F. G, B, D, F. Are you ready? And let's close it out with C, E, G. Ready? Okay. One note out of place there, but we can fix that. And we stop. Now, the point is this. Can you tell they're really playing together for the most part? You only have to polish this up. The church is the same way. I have a whole sermon, Pastor Jason, which I will not deliver now, about the church working together. And please pay attention to all these 22 groups of psalms, uh, portions, verses from Psalm 19, because that's where the meat's going to be. And uh, I've said enough. Now, the difficult part is putting the chimes away. So... What we'll do is have Colin and the, these, these four here lay them on the table. Don't worry about what order they're in. And then the group over here will do the same, and then we'll bring this group in here. Just line them one after the other, but not necessarily in order. Give them a hand, because this is tough. Yeah. We have any ad, we, this is just the beginning. But you see how well it worked. Look at the stair steps here. Thank you, Graham, and thank you, Nolan, and Carter, and Lydia, and Andrew, and someone else. I guess maybe me, I don't know. All right, Pastor, all right, we, let's just pray for the kids when you do this, Pastor Jason. Are we praying here? Yes. God, thank you for God's children. All God's children have a place in the choir. No matter what our age, we all have a place. Whether we think we can sing or not, we can play. So, Lord, help us to understand that the church is vital to the church itself and to those outside the, the, this congregation. 
Bless these children. Bless all the children in the choir. Amen. In Jesus. Blessed this morning as you just did auditions for the uh, for the bell choir. I like that. That was very clever. The rest of the church next week, and we'll be all set. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we rejoice in the music of your church, and it is your church, the bride for whom you died and gave your all that we would be washed and pure and without spot or blemish. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your abundant obedience to the Father, that we would be your glorious bride. And we pray this morning, Lord, for the church around the world, your bride international, your bride that will be of every tongue, every tribe, every nation. And we can add, Lord, of every generation. Thank You, O God, for there is a multitude waiting to be in Your presence to give You praise and to lift up Your name above every name and to willingly with joy bow our knee and confess with our tongue, Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And Lord, that is why we come to worship You today. And the praises that rise to You, Lord, come from our hearts. Hearts that know that we have been set free. Set free from our guilt and our shame of our sin. And Lord, we confess that to You even today. That we have broken Your commands. We have fallen from obedience to You time and time again. Even before the time of our salvation, whatever age that might have been, Lord, we were dead in our sin if not for the revival of Christ that came through the power of the Spirit. Bringing us alive and bringing us to a place of redemption and grace. Thank You, Lord Jesus, for this grace that You've poured upon us. Thank You, Holy Spirit, that You bring us together and give us gifts O oh Lord, to love one another and help us to love one another. We pray for those who are in need within our body, O oh Lord. We lift them up to You. Those who are hurting physically, and we have a, a multitude of them on a list that we pray for, Lord. Those that we know, we lift them up to You. We pray, O oh God, for those who need financial blessings, Lord. We pray for those who need uh, mental health, and good care in your, in your spirit to them, O oh Lord. We pray for those who are struggling in their marriages, Lord. We pray for those who might be struggling in their singleness. Father, we lift up to You those who are, who are grandparents, loving and caring and watching over and praying for their grandchildren and praying for their children and perhaps not even knowing yet if they have taken Your hand in salvation's grasp. Lord, we pray that You would reach out to generation after generation and let each one of us be a stepping stone for that generation, Lord. We praise You and we thank You for the gifts that we can give to tithe to You, Lord, to give an offering to You and just to show You that we understand everything that You have given us belongs to You. And so in joy, Lord, we give back to You this portion today in the, in the basket Lord, we pray that You would use it for Your glory, for Your purposes. And we pray, Lord, for those ministries and those missions that we support around the world and in our backyard. And even amongst us, O oh Lord, we lift up Pastor Don and we lift up Deidre even as they are vacationing right now, but we lift them up for the purposes of their ministry, Lord. For the international theological mission, Father, we lift them up and we know that COVID has kind of set things back, but we pray, Lord, that You would work miraculously and powerfully as there would be opportunities to teach and to reach those in Colombia and Latin America through this mission. Lord, we lift it up to You and we thank You that we can partner with it, Father. We pray, Father, right now 
that You would draw us close to Your Word, Your revealed truth to us, that we would cling to Your Word and know the truth of what You have revealed to us. That we can go from this place boldly and with assurance and love that we can share the truth of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we uh, continue these eight verses each Sunday, <clears throat> we have a new refrain and a new psalm tone. And just uh, listen in to the singers up here, and when you're comfortable, you'll have enough time in the next seven weeks to learn the new one. So. But let the Word of God soak into our very bones and our very hearts and our minds. Brother Ron, I couldn't wait to uh, get to this particular letter of the Hebrew alphabet so I could use the term just zayin. Uh, one of your favorite sayings. The title of this sermon is Just, just Zayin. It is God and us against the world. Have you felt that way? Have you felt that way lately? I heard just recently somebody said, it's you versus the world, and you're going to lose. That is absolutely true. 
if we were alone. But praise God, we have not only His Word, we have His presence, we have His truth, and He is with us. And brothers and sisters, it, when we look at this Scripture today, I want us to get a greater appreciation for just how the Word of God is our comfort and our strength and our song during the time when we feel the world is against us. Remember this caveat. If the world is striking out against you, it is not against you that it strikes. It is against whom? Christ Jesus. So let's consider this today as we come before the Lord's Word. Let's pray together. Father, teach us this day from Your Word. Holy Spirit, enlighten our eyes and our understanding that we would understand this portion of the poem. This letter from Hebrews, Zane, Lord, and understand exactly what You are calling forth for us that we would walk in Your ways this morning. Father, I pray Your blessing on us in greater understanding. As we call out to You, Lord, remember Your Word just as the psalmist cried out. Remember Your Word, O Lord, and give us comfort in times when we are oppressed. And may Your Word be the song upon our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've been starting out many of these by explaining to you the letter in the Hebrew that is beginning these next eight stanzas of this psalm. And this one is Zain, which seems in Zain that it would be in the middle of the Hebrew alphabet, right? Our Z is at the end. But here in Hebrew, it is right there at the beginning. And this Zane stands for, uh, in symbology, a matok. How many have used a matok? Yeah, how many had to look it up? Uh, I did. Yeah, I haven't grown up in a uh, farming community myself, but I can appreciate when I see this tool, okay, that looks like a good and useful tool. This symbol comes from the very use of that word way back when Hebrew was, was just forming as a language for people to write and to use. And so this symbol has gone on to be now Zane. But this isn't what the word means. It doesn't just mean this symbol of, of a matok, this tool for farming. It means what comes from the work that is done. It means food. It means to cut. And it means to nourish. And so really what I take out of this as I read what the author is doing, what he's bringing forth, the psalmist is bringing forth, the nourishment of God's Word in our life when we are seriously in danger. When we are feeling absolutely oppressed and pushed down and moved aside and ridiculed for our faith and our hope in God's Word, this is where the nourishment of God comes from. Daniel Aiken, uh, whose work I've used a lot as we've gone through this, Daniel Aiken is a fabulous writer, but he wrote this and brought back to mind some church history. So let me share this with you as we begin, one of the early heroes in the early church is Athanasius, 296 to 373 AD. He was a staunch defender of the full deity of the Son of God and against particularly the Arians, the Arians who believed that Jesus was a created being by God. The Arians were the forerunner to the Jehovah's Witnesses that we see to this day. The story goes that the tide was beginning to turn in the favor of the Arians theologically. And a concerned colleague said to Athanasius, Athanasius, the whole world is against you. And quickly and firmly, Athanasius responded, Athanasius contra mundum. Which means... Athanasius is against the world. In the stanza of Zain, in Psalm 119, the psalmist appears to feel much like Athanasius. The whole world is against him. 
The arrogant mock Him in verse 51. The wicked who ignore God's instruction in verse 53 seem to be everywhere. Yet one thing remains certain. God is faithful and will comfort Him in times of trouble. When everyone seems to be against Him in verses 49-56 to of Psalm 119, it provides encouragement and guidance for how you should think and how you should respond. Well, don't we wonder in those moments when we are pressed upon by people who are attacking us for our faith, how should I act right now, Lord? Should I attack them back? Should I speak my mind? Should I tell them to just shut up? What should I do? How should I act? How can I be like Christ? Well, look at the beginning of these verses here. Verse 49 and 50. Remember your word to your servant, in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. First thing he says is, God, remember your word. God, remember your word. And this is the only time in in this whole section of eight verses that there is an imperative plea to God. And the first plea is, Lord, just simply remember every promise that you have ever said. Remember all of those things. Now, here's the question. Does God ever forget them? No. But it's an impassioned plea to say, Lord, act upon these, please. Act upon in everything that you have promised. Let it be true in my life. In fact, he goes so far as to say is that when you remember, O Lord, your word, it gives me hope. It actually even makes me hope. It brings hope to me. You have made me hope. This is something that you have put in me, Lord. Hope is putting our trust in an object that is trustworthy. Hope is counting on the character and the quality of the thing that you are trusting in. So as the psalmist is crying out to the Lord, the highest of all, the King of Heaven, and all of the promises that up to that point the psalmist had seen God fulfill, what had He fulfilled? He called Abraham out of Ur. With He was just Abram. He promised him not only a, a nation of people, but a blessing to all of the nations and actually a land. This psalmist, we don't know if it's King David or if it's someone else, but in his day, that had all been fulfilled. They were living in the promised land of God. God had seen them through all of their enemies, taken them out of Egypt, and had given them this redemption and promises that still lingered of one day Messiah. God coming and He Himself ruling over His people in love and truth and blessing all of the nations. And so what was He calling forth at this moment? God, fulfill all of these purposes. For you and I, We consider the Lord over the generations and what He has done. He has kept His Word, has He not? He has given us Messiah. He has given us Jesus Christ. Our promised deliverance from sin's justice of death and hell. And He has brought us in by His own hand into God's mercy in Christ. Grace, and now we are His children. Though this is our hope, even now the Scripture says this, that not only has He come and risen, but what? He is coming again. Don't we want to cry out, Lord, God, remember Your Word? Come again. As all of the other promises have been fulfilled that You have given, come again. This is my hope. Not in just, uh, I, I wish that it would be true, but in the character of God who has made it true. 
by the truth of everything that He has done. In my life, in your life, throughout the history of the church and the blessings that He has given us. Well, look at what He says here. He says, This very thing, remember Your Word, Lord, in which You have made me hope. I hope in this very Word, but not only that, You have given us comfort. Lord, this is my comfort in my affliction. Who is this beautiful young lady that I put up there? This is Cassandra. Yeah, this is my little Cassandra who's all grown up and and now teaching. This is Cassandra in the age where uh, we had to send her to uh, daycare. And it broke our hearts at the time because she was not wanting any of it. And in a, in a moment of panic, as we sent her off and we were looking at the list of things that she needed to go off to daycare, one of the things was a doll. Okay, so my wife and I were even reflecting on this. She said it was a last minute grab. We grabbed a little, a little doll and you can see Cassandra kind of holding that doll like near her sippy cup. By the way, I just introduced you all to Yellow Baby. Okay, because that day when she went to childcare, what became her comfort in oppression? What became her nearest and dearest friend from which she would not leave, nor would she uh, allow us to go home from Disneyland until we have gone all the way back and searched for it on a tram? This is Yellow Baby, the comfort in that time. And by the way, we tried to switch out Yellow Baby because it was getting a little old and a little... So we bought another one and we switched it out. And one day she picked picked it up and she just did this. I mean, she just did this quick double take. And I I tell you, it, it wasn't even a minute she had that baby in her hand. She looked at it. She said, this isn't Yellow Baby. This is Green Baby. And she could tell by the slight tint in the hair on this little thing. What comfort has God given us that is there with us in this time of affliction? This time when she felt alone and the times when she was missing mommy and daddy, Yellow Baby became her dear friend. But for you and I in true affliction, the reliability of the word that God has spoken should be for us a comfort. Job said this in Job 6.10, and boy, we know Job went through oppression, didn't he? This would be my comfort. I would even exalt in my pain unsparing, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Paul echoes this in another way in Romans 15.4. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction and through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures that we might have hope. What we don't realize is that this very book that we have is for our encouragement and hope in times not only when they're good, but especially when we're being attacked for holding to these very words. This very truth. This is what makes us hope. This is what gives us comfort. And not only that, this is what revives our lives revives our lives. Look at this. He says, your promise gives me life. Quite literally, he says, your promise keeps me alive. The promises that you make keep me alive, O Lord. I am the man drowning in the ocean. Whether it is my sin or it is the oppression of the world because I follow you, whatever it is, you're the one who holds me up and lifts me out. If we're looking for anything else in this world, if we're maybe even trying to blend in with the world, how good is it for the person who's drowning right here to blend in with his surroundings? What's going to be the result? Yeah, death. Drowning. He needs somebody to pluck him out of that situation, that circumstance. Psalm 71.20 says, You have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. 
those times when we're in painful opposition, when you feel like you stand alone, and the world seems like it is posed against you and is even calling you the liar. Your promises are not in who you are. The promises that you rest upon are in who God is and His Holy One. The Sovereign Redeemer of sinners. Remember who you hold to according to His Word. His Word has revealed to us how true and how wonderful He is, right? How He forgives us of sin and sets it as far as the east is from the west. How else would we know but by God speaking to us? My question is, when opposition comes, do we find ourselves quickly wanting to blend in to our surroundings? Not to be seen, not to be heard, but to be ignored and and left alone? But the Lord has revived us and will revive us. Even in those times when you think that you are crushed. I remember times when I was going to school, especially as I was going to a, a secular university. I've told you guys about this. Secular university studying religion. I felt like I was under attack not only from my professors continually as I studied this. And they said, you're a fool if you believe any of this. And here I am reading this, and they're reading the Greek and the Hebrew. I don't know any of that. And they're saying, yep, see right here again, you're a fool if you believe this. How could there ever be an axe hand or an axe head that would float to the surface of the water? How would that ever be true? How could there ever be a worldwide flood that would cover all things? Oh no, you can see quite clearly this isn't true. I'll tell you the most powerful thing one person, a brother of mine, preached once on the axe head that floated in the story. By the way, look that up. That is a fantastic story. He asked, he said, did the axe head float or did it not? All of Scripture hinges on this one question. Did the axe head float? Because if it did, everything in it is true. And I realized even during those darkest times, it was God's Word that gave me an anchor. His Spirit was was with me and yes, was was strengthening me and helping me and bringing people into my life to to correct and and to be able to defend against and give give me an answer to those who were attacking the Lord's Word and really what I felt like was me. And later I realized, you know what? You're really striking against Christ. You're not striking against me. And so, why should I be afraid? What can man do to me if he he is the one who has brought about all of this? He is the one who revives my life. He saved me from the pit. Death is literally undone by Christ. And we know this according to his word. Eternal life has been given to us. We have life now and eternally. Isaiah 54, 17 said this, and I want us to remember this because this is God's Word to us in the midst of opposition. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. And the very tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Hallelujah. There is good news. We love the fact that God remembers His Word. Why? Because it makes us hope, it gives us comfort, and it brings about life in us. It revives us. When we're down in our deepest part of our lives, it revives us. So let's talk about that for a moment. Let's talk about the opposition that comes our way. Question for you. Is there opposition in this world? Is there, does there seem to be any sort of target on the back of Christians today? Does that target seem to be growing? Does there seem to be an insurmountable amount of people that are even trying to take away the voice of Christians 
that they would be silenced, particularly Christians and others who are very religious are allowed to speak freely. But those who proclaim Christ are to be silenced. Those who proclaim that there's one and one only way to the Father. Not because we say so, because let's all be honest, in our flesh we'd love to say, hey, y'all get in, sure. Because that way I'm not so bad and you're not so bad and we don't really have to answer to anybody. But according to God's Word, who do I have to answer to? To Him. I'm not comparing my righteousness to one another. I'm comparing it to the one who is eternally and perfectly righteous. And before Him, I stand condemned. And I need salvation. And so do you. And He's made a way. By His grace, He's also brought forth justice and mercy upon the cross. And there is only now one way that we can be saved. And that's through Him. Does the world want to hear that? No. So what does the world do? It, it spins lies. And it mocks and it ridicules. I want to ask you a question. Has anything changed? Look at verse 51. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from old, I take comfort, O Lord. The arrogant scorn us. In here, in the, the Hebrew, it says they utterly deride. I like how the ESV, ESV brings this out. They, they mock us continually. They mock and they block in many ways, much like this large rock. By, by the way, this is in California. There's areas in California, if you've ever seen the mudslides and the things that happen. See, California's kind of like a, a desert by the ocean. And so when the, the, the rains come, it gets nice and green and everything like that. But guess what they don't have is deep roots. So everything that turns green eventually starts to slide and you get these giant mudslides. And this is this boulder fell down in the past. And I look at this and it, it just kind of brings forth this idea. I, I was going to put up people mocking and pointing and all these other things, but we understand. We understand what it is to be mocked. Turn on a sitcom on TV today. Who is the butt of the joke? See, yeah, Christians. Those who would profess loving your neighbor, loving your enemy, forgiving others when they hurt you, mock them. We don't have to go far. In fact, there's already a teardown of even the, the chaplaincy within our universities. Those who would go forth and proclaim and share Christ did you know, even this week, who was just announced as the president of the Chaplain Association of Harvard University? Harvard University was a Puritan, a Puritan established university by John Harvard with the very motto, and this is the motto, the truth for Christ in the church was the motto of Harvard. And now an atheist is the president of the Chaplain Association. I never knew that atheists made a religion out of it. But it's true. Here now at this point, we're seeing that, that the church has been pushed to obscurity and the word of Christ is now even denied. In fact, Mr. Epstein, who is the one who wrote this, he also is the one who wrote this book that says, Good Without God. That's the motto of the world, is it not? We're good without God. We don't need Him. Do not doubt that what God does in the darkness, He will, do not doubt that what is done in darkness will also be revealed in the light of truth. And here's the heart of this, is as much as we're mocked, what does the author say he will not do? Though the world might turn from the Word of God, what will he not do? Turn. This is where we have to stand and say, you know what? 
No, I have nowhere else to go. If I were to blend into the environment, that means that I'm going to join those who are dead. But I have been made alive through Christ and I stand on His Word and His Word alone. Much like Peter said to Jesus, you have the words of life. Where else can we go? Are we willing to stand and say, this is what I believe, not just because it makes me feel good and gives me comfort and gives me peace and makes me alive, but because it's true. And in a world that wants to turn from truth continually, brothers and sisters, we are called to hold fast. Called to hold fast. He says in verse, thir- uh, verse 53, hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. The wicked care nothing for your word. And so what will I do? I will remember and take comfort. Look at verse 52. When I think of your rules from, uh, from old, I take comfort, O Lord. He calls out to God at the beginning. He says, Lord God, remember your words. And what does that bring to him? Comfort and strength. And now in this time of opposition, what does he say to himself? I'm going to remember God's word. He's remembering. He's holding true. I'm going to remember. I'm going to hold true. But what does that require, O body of Christ? that we would hold fast to the words of God. What does it presuppose at the beginning? That we know God's Word. There's Barna studies that are out today. I, I can't quote you all of the different percentages and things like that at this moment. But there is a high percentage of evangelical Christians today who say there's other ways to get to heaven. That the Word of God is not necessarily all the Word of God. But instead, they have a little nuance. It contains the Word of God. These are evangelicals. These are people that we would say we agree theologically in all these different points. But if you're starting to doubt the very Word of God and saying, well, you know what, not all of it. i got to pick out which ones are really His. we have now just slipped into a dangerous place. Especially when we face opposition because how are we going to stand and say, thus says the Lord, when we go, oh wait, not this page. This page. Yeah, he might have said this. Back in the 1980s, following into the 90s and then into the 2000s, there was a council called the Jesus Council. Has anybody heard of them? They would actually, there were a group of scholars that would gather together and they would vote based on their historic perspective and their, their studying and understanding the language and the culture of the words that Jesus had spoken and they would vote on whether or not he actually said them. Yeah. Yeah, there were black beads, gray beads, and I think it was like a, a pink bead or something like that on whether or not he spoke it. The closest thing that they all agreed on was a gray bead of he might have said this was give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. They don't even agree on the second part. And give unto the Lord what is the Lord's. This is how lost the world is. I want us to understand this. They don't even know exactly what God is saying. And they're, they're divvying up the little parts of His Word rather than hearing the truth that you are sinners needing salvation that only Christ can bring. And here we sit in opposition and those who would turn and say they care nothing for the Lord's Word. And we need to in this moment right now, brothers and sisters, remember His Word and take comfort that we have His Word spoken to us. Take comfort in this truth. Don't let it pass by. Don't let it sit on the shelf and get dusty. Now, I know some of you are going to say, well, wait a second, Pastor. You just, passed off, you just completely passed off on the hot indignation part. 
I want us to step back and look at that again, Pastor. Sure. Let's look at this. Let's look at this and let's consider why is he so, in fact, the words in the Hebrew is he is, he is enraged. He's upset. He's terrorized. He's horrified by what he sees. Why is this great horrification in his heart? Why is he looking with such terror that seizes him when he sees those who have turned from God's word? Notice the term, have turned from God's word. Who is he looking at and all of a sudden just overridingly upset about? From those who proclaimed that they were believers and now aren't living like it at all. That's what seizes him inside. In fact, John Calvin says it's not a matter of he's hotly mad at them, but instead he's horrified by what God is going to do when he brings his judgment to those who knew his word and then turn from it utterly and scorn it and are ashamed of it and go back to the ways of the world, join in with the surrounding water that they're drowning in. You know, in the history of Israel, Israel always had an issue with God. God always wanted them to stand out and be set apart. He said, you are my chosen what? People. You are my chosen nation. A people of, for my very own. I've set you apart. You're going to dress differently. You're going to eat differently. You're going to have a covenant that's different. you got a God that's different. And what was the one issue that continually, as you read the Old Testament, continually was the issue on Israel's part. Uh, Lord, we want to blend in. We want to be like all the other nations. We want a king like they have. We want gods like they have. We want to be like everybody else. Now, I'm not degrading what the saints before went through because what do we also do? The same thing. We want to blend in. We want to fit in. And instead of standing on God's Word and standing on the truth of Christ and holding fast to Him, this hot indignation does not mean that we go on the attack. No. It doesn't mean that we now turn the tables and we mock them. No. It doesn't mean that we now rise up violently and defend God's Word. Please. No. He is the judge. And wrath is His. And justice is His. But what we can do is not only remember His Word and take comfort in it, but we can pray for and proclaim to those who have forgotten the truth. To those who have walked away from the greatness of God. Calvin said this, and I'll just repeat this. The prophet asserts that he was seized with horror because though he considered the long-suffering of God on one hand, yet on the other, he was fully persuaded that he must sooner or later bring swift punishment to those who had fallen away. And so the prophet is shocked that anyone would walk away from God in this way. So what are we to do? How are we, as we take comfort in God's Word and the world doesn't, what is our natural reaction? What's the thing that comes to your mind that we should do because we've been revived, because we've been made new, because of all these things? What should we do? Sing! Amen! You read the psalm. Praise God! Look at this. For your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. Our songs will rise to the Lord. Our songs will rise. Our indignation of joy in Christ Himself, our delight will come. Well, this doesn't mean that it'll just happen once in a while. Look at what he says. He says, I will be reclaiming you in the daytime. 
He says, your statutes have been my song in the house of my sojourning. This idea that as I go through this life, I'm in this place that is right now my home. But what does the term sojourning mean? I'm traveling through. He realizes that this whole world that everybody wants to blend in and match in with is passing away and just temporal. This isn't our total home. He's saying this is just the home I'm passing through. And so what is my song in the place where I'm passing? All of your word. Your good things. The things that you have done. The things that you have promised. That's what I proclaim in the daytime. I shout. I have joy for. But what happens when the evening comes? What happens when the darkness falls upon the sky and night comes? What does He say? I remember Your name in the night. O Yahweh, He says in the Hebrew. And keep Your law. Our comfort in the time of darkness, the darkness perhaps of our souls, dealing with our sin or dealing with persecution or dealing with the problems of our life, this darkness in this moment is the time in which we remember the truth of not just His Word, but what does it say? I remember Your what? Your name. You, O Lord. It's not just going from a piece of paper or anything like that, but I realize that every word that you've spoken is you who's been revealed to me. And so what will I remember in the dark times and the moments where perhaps it's even physical darkness and you're laying there in bed and it's just you and God and you know what you've struggled with throughout the day. That temptation or that trial or maybe that missed word that you said to somebody and you hurt them deeply. Or something else that you've turned away from or you know you're ignoring and you should be obedient to. That time in the night when it's just you and who else beside you? The Lord. I wanted to suggest, let His name be your nightlight. Let His truth overwhelm you even as you rest. Even as you're there in the night and perhaps you've had like me those moments in the night when you are wrestling with God. Just trying to do your own thing and He's saying, obey my son, obey. And finally before the morning and you're just exhausted, you're saying, okay Lord, much like Jacob wrestling you, I'm not going to now let go until you bless me. Because I realize I've got nothing without you. I need you. And brothers and sisters, we need to be able to draw close to the Lord and understand His graciousness and His goodness to us. But I wonder how many times we just fall asleep even though He's saying we need to talk and we ignore that. And perhaps we just let it drift. And one night passes, another night passes, and our hearts begin to harden. I want us to look at what we're what we're hearing from the psalmist. I remember him in the night. The meditation of the believer at night is on God himself. Not just his word, but his character, his promises, all that he has fulfilled, all that he is in his person and let him glow in the dark for you. That you would see the dawn with the hope and the joy that only comes from Christ Jesus. And know that He has forgiven you now and forever. And He will be with you in the midst of your opposition and those who assail you and those who mock you. He will be there for you. We're reminded, men's group, we're reading through Luke right now. By the way, men, come join us. Men's group, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock at the church office. Love to have you there. We're studying Luke. And in Luke chapter 6, Jesus was sharing to His very disciples. He said, no one's greater than their teacher. In fact, what is their greatest aspiration? To be like their teacher. That's you and I, brothers and sisters, as we sing of God's goodness in the day and in the night and utterly retaining a blessing 
I love this. I love the way he said this. He said, the bl- this blessing has fallen on me. Well, what is this blessing that he says? It's the very fact that he now obeys and he keeps the precepts of God. The very things that people mock, he lives, it's his life. And he says, it's now, it's come to me. It's, it's now part of something I've retained. It's now something that, that is part of the intricately woven elements of my DNA. This is particularly mine, he says, that I keep your precepts. He's not boasting in his own merit. I want us to be corrected of that. He's not boasting that he's obtained some sort of special blessing because of obedience. But he draws us back that it is God, remember in verse 49, it is God who remembers his word and his promises. And because of that, he is now fulfilled and able to follow him. But it all rests on the first part that God would be the one who remembers his word. And that cascading truth that results from the gift of God is now ours. And now we have obtained it because God has promised it to us. Not that we'll be perfect in this life, but that we can now in Christ be obedient and follow Him and do so out of love and service to the Lord. I'll end with this. Tim Keller wrote in Songs of Jesus, elsewhere in God's Word, God's Word says is said to preserve life. And in many cases, this might literally be survival. But here, in this, these verses, it means even more. The Bible created endurance. Its promises lift the heart in a panoramic insight of strength and will. Its truth is spiritual manna that keeps our feet and our ability to go on. Keeps us on our feet and our ability to go on. Brothers and sisters, let's stay on our feet and let's continue to walk in the path of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us in this because we face much opposition in this life right now. We face trials and tribulations within the church in America, within our own church, Lord. There are many things that would derail us Many things that would make us want to hide or blend in or give up. But thank You, O Lord, that You, Lord Jesus, for the joy set before You endured the shame and the scorn that came from being who You are. And endured the cross for us that we may now, by Your love and sacrifice for us, we may now endure the shame and the scorn walking in the footsteps of our Master and Lord, still behaving and loving and acting as Christ. Lord, help us to do so, though it goes against our flesh and our will, help us to do so that we may be able to have that moment to proclaim You to those who have forgotten your ways, to those who have scorned you and mocked you, may we proclaim the loving grace that comes from our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Set our feet. Set our feet on lofty places. Gird our lives that they may be armored with all Christ-like graces. In the fight to set men free, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, that we fail not man nor thee, that we fail not man nor thee. We get to sing the same tune that we did at the beginning of the service, uh, but to a text, God of grace and God of glory from our red uh, hymnal 528. Sing with us together. Stand.
and be on our feet. A standing hymn. Has equipped each and every one of us with a powerful weapon. You know what that is? The Word of God. The Word that goes out and transforms and changes hearts of those with stone in their souls to hearts of flesh. It only comes by the Word of God and by the power of His Spirit. So brothers and sisters, go forth in the power of God's Word. And live it and proclaim it every moment of every day. May the joy of Christ and the peace of our King, who has brought all of those who are away from Him to be His children, may His strength be upon you as you proclaim His truth now and forever. Walk with Him in obedience. Trust in Him faithfully, and see that He will not revive your soul, give you comfort, strength, and peace for the journey ahead. For the world cannot stop you. It is already Christ. Let us follow Him now and forever, brothers and sisters. God bless you this morning.